Aloha, I'm Congressman Ed Case, reporting to you again from Washington, D.C. This is part of my effort to outreach to you on the issues that I'm confronting every day here in Washington, D.C. And along the way, I run into very interesting people who are doing very interesting jobs. And my effort is to educate you as to what they do, how this all fits together. Uh, I have many different ways of reporting back to you, and I have many different ways that you can contact uh, me. Uh, throughout the course of this uh, show, uh, down at the bottom of your screen, you'll see telephone numbers, a website, uh, an email address, and other information by which you can uh, get in touch with me. I really want to hear from you. One of the most important things I can say to you is please sign up for my newsletter. You can do that by going to my website at case.house.gov. That'll give you a direct report from me as often as I can get it to you. But these uh, television shows are mostly about me just spending a little bit of time with you on public television, which I very much uh, support. I thank public television for showing my shows. Uh, and we'll do this uh, both uh, here in Washington with a variety of issues and people, and we'll also do it back home. I'm going to have some talk stories coming up back, back in the district, and we'll film those and get them out to you as well. So if you can't make them, you can also uh, watch them on public television. So uh, with that, uh, I want to introduce a very, very interesting uh, person. Uh, I serve now on the House Appropriations uh, Committee, which is responsible for allocating um, our federal spending every year. Uh, and I serve on a subcommittee, which is the subcommittee on the legislative branch. And that's the subcommittee that basically decides uh, what money Congress is going to spend in order to fulfill our function. And to put a little bit of context to my guest, I want to say again uh, that under our system, Congress is a separate, independent, and co-equal branch of government. Separate, independent, and co-equal branch of government. We're not responsible for giving the executive or the legislative or the, or the judicial branches a pass. We're responsible for working with them, but we're also responsible for, for providing that check and balance. But how do we do that? Uh, how do we actually have the knowledge, the expertise, the ability uh, to go out there and decide uh, whether we think the executive branch is doing a good job or not, whether we think uh, uh, something needs to be fixed throughout our government? Uh, we have to have our own internal resources, independent resources, because if we simply rely on the executive branch, which really has most of the money, uh, if you think about it, uh, we have a $4 trillion budget, $4 trillion budget overall that we spend uh, Congress's budget is about $4 billion, which is, you know, one one-thousandth of the, of the overall amount. And so we've got to have our own expertise, because if, if we ask the executive branch, well, you know, tell us what you think with your expertise about something that we are questioning the executive branch about, then how are we going to do our job? So we have two incredible uh, institutions within Congress uh, that help us uh, to do our job. Uh, one is the Library of Congress, the largest and uh, certainly most sophisticated library in the world, but within the Library of Congress, the Congressional Research Service, which is an amazing group of folks uh, that are responsible only to Congress for doing our research and our analysis. And the next one is the Government Accountability Office, uh, which is an arm of Congress. And I'm really, really happy uh, in that context to introduce to you uh, Mr. Gene Dodaro, who is the head of the Government Accountability Office, which we're going to shorten to uh, GAO, and he has the very fancy title of Comptroller General of the United States. So, Mr. Dodaro, thank you very much for being with us here. My pleasure, Congressman Kay. And I really appreciate it. By the way, we got to know each other uh, through the uh, legislative appropriations process. You came uh, just a couple of weeks ago to our subcommittee and uh, gave what I thought was an incredible presentation of the GAO. Uh, you described it, uh, and um, um, you know my responsibility, of course, is to make sure that you're uh, doing your job and spending your money wisely. But um, I certainly had a lot of trust with you from that uh, presentation, and and so you very kindly agreed when I came up to you after the hearing, uh, said, "Hey, that was such a great education for me. Can you share it with the folks back home?" You you agreed, and so here we are. Yes, yeah, very good. Now, I, well, our primary clients are the Congress. Our beneficial clients are the American people. So I'm very ha happy to share our story with the people of Hawaii. Well, okay, thank you very much. Well, let, let's just start, you know, in Hawaii we always say, hey, where are you from? So, uh, where are you from? What, what, what brought you to this, uh, this uh, incredible uh, responsibility that you have? Yeah, I was uh, born and raised in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania area, and I went to college in Pennsylvania, and actually GAO came to campus and recruited me. I went there as a entry-level auditor after I graduated with a degree in accounting back in 1973. Oh, wow. So I've been at GAO 46 years. Uh, I've been in the Comptroller General position now for 11 uh, of those years, uh, a little over eight years as uh, once I was confirmed. 
Uh, and uh, so I have, have uh, seven more years left on my 15-year term. So you, you haven't worked anywhere other than GAO your entire professional life? That's correct. That's correct. I, I wanted to dedicate myself to public service. Mm -hmm. GAO is a wonderful organization to do that because we get to look across the entire federal government, make recommendations to the executive branch and to the Congress, and our recommendations get implemented, uh, over 75% uh, of them on a regular basis. We save billions of dollars every year, and we have a real impact on issues dealing with public safety and security of this country. And so. It's a wonderful way to give back to your country. Hmm. What I mean, what attracted you to to to, to the GAO? I mean, they came on campus. They they did this interview. Did you know anything about the GAO then? Were you inclined uh, yeah. to public service to I, start with? Or? Yeah, I was inclined to public service. My uh, grandfather on my father's side was an immigrant from Italy, and they went to work in the steel mills in in Pittsburgh. And he was a big proponent of education. And I felt like this country had given my family, a, a, a wonderful opportunity, came from a very poor region in, in, in Italy, and so we had the blessings of this country mm -hmm. in order to develop. So I wanted to get back to the country, and I was also an accounting major who wanted to do more than just accounting, mm -hmm. and uh, GAO offers, policy over and above that. Accounting, yes, right? yes, and, and GAO, while we do do financial auditing, mm -hmm. it's only about 5% of what we do. Most of what we do is program evaluation, mm -hmm. policy analysis and dealing with a wide range of issues facing the Congress and the country. And so it, it uh, married up my interest for you know, public service with an incredible job that has mm -hmm. immense diversity. Mm -hmm. uh, now, have you, have you been to every state? I, I can't say I've been to every state. I've been to most of them, All right. many you, countries, because we do do some international. I see. Uh, and have you been to Hawaii? Yeah. I'm going to have to ask you that right away. I've been to Hawaii once. Unfortunately, it was too brief a visit. Yeah. I went there to uh, deliver a speech at a conference yeah. once. You parachuted in uh, and went to Waikiki, gave a speech, and left. Yes. I was very disappointed uh -huh. with that. Uh, well, we'll <laughs> have to somehow encourage you to come back to Hawaii. I don't know if I can invent a really good reason for you to come professionally, but you know, personally, it's cool, too. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to GAO. I mean, what what is GAO? Where did it come from? Uh, how did it evolve? Um, how did it become what it is today? Yeah, GAO was founded in 1921 on what was called the Budget and Accounting Act at that time. And this occurred after World War II because the Congress was very concerned about the debt that it, the United States government had accumulated during that period of World time. World War One, right? Yeah, World War One. I'm sorry. sorry. Okay. Yeah, World so the War Great I. War that we're coming yes. up on. We're at the hundredth anniversary and. Obviously, yes. an incredibly um, expensive war, as all wars are. Yes. And, and so, at that time, the Congress created the process by which the President submits a budget to the Congress every year. Uh, and it created a, an executive office position, uh, what's now known as the Office of Management Budget, and the President to prepare a budget and to oversee the budget for the executive branch agencies. And it created GAO to be an independent auditing uh, organization. And uh, so we were then formed out of some parts of the, of the Treasury Department at that time, but we were housed in the legislative branch of Congress, and the Comptroller General was given this 15-year term to ensure our independence in auditing. So, so we're organizationally separate from the executive branch that we audit. You have absolutely no obligations to the executive branch, no, correct? No, that's, uh, that's exactly right. Mm -hmm. You know, the president selects from a list by a bicameral, bipartisan uh, congressional commission in order to nominate the position because it is a political appointment. Mm -hmm. uh, but once you're confirmed, I cannot be removed by the president, mm -hmm. only by the full Congress. Mm -hmm. That's to ensure our, our, uh, our independence, but also provides great continuity. I mean, we have more continuity than any other federal department agencies in the government, so that's why we mm -hmm. have become the de facto institutional memory for the Congress. Right, so 98 uh, years of GAO, how many how many uh, Comptroller Generals? Which one are you? I'm the eighth. You're only the eighth? I'm only the eighth, years. yeah. Four of my seven predecessors mm -hmm. served the full 15 years. I see. Yeah, one unfortunately died early mm -hmm. in his tenure, and the other ones left a little bit early mm -hmm. for various reasons, but four of them did the full 15 years. Now, you said uh, that GAO was formed out of a desire to have an, I think you said, independent auditing function right. in, in the co housed in the Congress. Uh, and I think, you know, the two operative words there are independent uh, and auditing. Because I, I think a lot of people understand what an audit is, but do you, you know, how, do, how, does, how does what you do compare to 
what most people understand an audit to be, which is, you know, for a company or a, an organization where you've got a bunch of, you know, accountants coming in and like mm -hmm. studying your books and, you know, reporting on whether you're keeping your books accurately or not. Is that what you do? That, that's part of what we do, but a very small part. You know, we're the auditor for the federal government's financial statements, which we do on a regular basis. And I is, issue a the federal Special government does have financial statements. Yes, we do That's have a pretty obvious <laughs> question that I yeah. sometimes get asked. Well, actually, it wasn't until 1990. In the 1990s, GAO pushed for a number of years to get Congress to require agencies to prepare financial statements and to have independent financial audits. So our government existed for 200 years without financial statements mm -hmm. and without annual regular audits, independent mm -hmm. financial audits. So we do do that. I advise Congress on the fiscal health of the federal government, and we can talk mm -hmm. more about that. I'd like to get into that. And uh, about most of what we do, though, 95% of what we do is look to see whether federal programs and activities are being carried out in accordance with law, mm -hmm. how the agencies are spending the money, whether their activities are efficient and effective. We look at everything from the Medicare program to defense mm -hmm. weapon systems acquisitions to transportation to energy, education department, any facet of the federal government, but we're mostly focused on you know, ways to make the government more efficient and effective mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and to be the primary oversight tool to help the Congress mm -hmm. exercise its constitutional responsibility for the checks and balances in our, in our Constitution. I mean, Congress has massive right. responsibilities and it needs good independent information to right, conduct exactly. uh, rigorous oversight. Now, we, all, we both know that unfortunately Congress is in a pretty uh, politically uh, divisive time and there's disagreement on issues and sometimes there's disagreement over you know, political appointments, which you are. How, how does, uh, you're responsible for assisting Congress in discharging our responsibility and that gives you the ability to be independent as to the executive branch, but how are you independent from Congress? Is that a function of your 15-year term? And let's let's get yeah, into a little bit right. more how what it takes to actually kick you out. Yeah, yeah. Well, I can only be impeached by the full Congress uh, for specified reasons. Right. Uh, and uh, and that's the yeah. that's the whole that's the entire that's essentially the same process that we're, as we're talking about for a president or a federal federal judges for life, right? I mean, yes. Got to. Yeah. It's got to originate in the House, and and uh, there has to be a resolution right. in the Senate. So in other words, right. it's very, very difficult to impeach you. Yes, yes, and there are specified reasons that uh, you know would be candidates for mm -hmm. things that you would be impeached for. I can assure you that I would meet any of those requirements and yes. don't intend to do that. Mm -hmm. And uh, well, nonetheless, so, it guarantees that you are somewhat removed from. Obviously, you get requests from many members of Congress, right. but you, you, in, in terms of the discharge of your responsibilities, your your judgment is not influenced by whether somebody's going to kick you out next year. No, or so. absolutely not. Right. Absolutely not. And we conduct all our, our activities and our policies and procedures in a nonpartisan fashion. It's very important that both parties and both chambers of Congress trust that GAO will give them independent, nonpartisan non-political, uh, you know, uh, independent facts so that they can make good decisions. And in many cases, you know, we don't make policy decisions for the Congress, but we give them facts and options and things that they can do in order to exercise their political judgment. Uh, we're not to substitute our judgment for the political judgment of the Congress, but we're to inform the Congress so they can make well-informed mm -hmm. decisions mm -hmm. based on the facts mm -hmm. uh, of the matter. And we take that very seriously. And we, everybody in GAO works hard every day to make sure that we conduct ourselves in a nonpartisan, professional uh, manner, and that's very important. I also have good constructive working relationships with the executive branch because even though we report to the Congress, uh, you know, I want to make sure that the executive branch feels that we're being fair and professional and conducting our work. We listen carefully to their views and formulating our opinions and that they're implementing our recommendations. So every year I send a letter to every major department agency in the federal government outlining what recommendations they have yet to implement uh, and give priority to ones I think would save the country money mm -hmm. or improve public safety or the effectiveness of government programs for the benefit of the American people. Now tell me a little bit about just the people of uh, GAO. I mean, how many, who are they, what, what, what kind of functions do they, they fulfill? Uh, I think I recall you uh, testifying before my subcommittee that your retention is incredibly high. 
that people like you come and spend an entire career there? What, what, who are they? Um, uh, you know, what is the range of their responsibilities, and 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 what is their motivation? Yes, uh, we have over 3,100 professional people at the GAO, and they come from all over the country. Uh, we have a nationwide recruiting effort. We actually have regional offices across the continental United States. Uh, we used to have an office in Hawaii years ago where we did a lot of work mm -hmm. in uh, Vietnam during sure. the Vietnam War and other areas. Uh, but uh, due to you know, various factors, we've consolidated mostly now to mm -hmm. 11 offices. Mm -hmm. uh, but we, uh, these are all people from every different type of discipline you can think of. We have not only the financial auditors needed, but we have public policy, public an, uh, analysts who have subject area expertise in virtually all aspects of the federal government's operations defense experts, for example, and contracting experts. and We have actuaries. We have economists. We have a big legal department. We have social science research, operations research people, information technology specialists, computer security specialists, scientists. We've got physics, uh, you know, people with physical sciences, all type of engineering degrees, some chemists, and other areas and, and we also have a standing contract with the National Academy of Sciences, mm. another organization that's chartered by the Congress to give independent advice and so we pull on their expertise because uh, we can't have everything in-house mm -hmm. resident mm -hmm. at all times mm -hmm. uh, you know in the GAO. So you go out and find the expertise when you don't have it in in-house you have the capability and the resources to go out and find the best wherever they are. Oh yes, yes, yeah, well on, on almost Every engagement, you know, we can bring in the best experts in the country uh, on any different topic, whether it's opioid uh, use, which we've done on a number of cases, or how to dispose of radioactive material. We've done work looking at alternative nuclear reactors. We've done you know, a wide variety of issues. Mm -hmm. we, we have access to the best uh, experts in the country. Now, we don't contract out the work to them. We, but we work with them to give us advice and right. we maintain, maintain responsibilities right. under our quality standards for issuing the reports. Everybody at GAO is a career public servant. We have our own personnel authorities. I'm the only political appointee and, and actually I'm the first Comptroller General to actually been a career person uh, first. Hmm. And uh, so it, it gives us a lot of stability in the organization. Most of our people have advanced degrees, masters, many of them all are economists or do have doctorates and you know of course have a lot of people that are have passed the bar exams uh, in the How do you keep track of all of this? You know you got you, you're the head of it all and you got 3100 people doing all manner of things um, in all manner of stages. I mean do you mm -hmm. Do you have a full-on computer system that kind of tracks progress of projects uh, over time and um, you know delivery and uh, log everything in and log it out and yes yes we do mm -hmm. you know I, I have full visibility of all at any one point in time we're probably doing five or six hundred different audits yeah. and I have visibility on when we accept requests from the Congress and making that decision how we scope those requests to make sure they're fair objective and they're going to produce you know, good professional nonpartisan results uh, and how those reports then go through the process. I review many of the reports myself. We have a risk-based system uh, where we identify these areas. Uh, you know, I am, uh, designed this system when I was the chief operating officer for nine years at, mm. at the GAO before I became Comptroller General. So for 20 years, I've either been the number two person or in charge of the organization. So I have a pretty good knowledge of what's going on at all times. Mm -hmm. Most of the people there I've hired and promoted uh, to senior executive positions. And we have a, you know, a standard structure where we have entry-level auditors, you know, and then we have mid-level managers and then senior executives. And our senior executives are experts. We have about 70 people that regularly provide expert testimony to the Congress at congressional hearings, in addition to myself, so we can reach all the committees. We do work for 90 percent of the standing committees of the Congress and about over half of the subcommittees. So we have a wide footprint across the Congress to provide expert advice on a regular basis. Mm -hmm. Our people work with congressional staff. I meet with the heads of um, committee leaders, both the chair and ranking members. 
of uh, all the committees. I Ranking members is the senior member of the party that is not in the majority. Yeah, that's so exactly right. Chair, the chair is in the majority party. The ranking member is in the minority party. Right, right. That way we, you know, maintain our nonpartisan status and we treat both parties the same. Right. They have equal access to us. Mm -hmm. And I want to make sure we're meeting the priorities of everyone mm -hmm. uh, in the Congress to the extent possible. Now, what's your budget? Our budget, is, uh, budget authority for this fiscal year is about $636 million. And so $636 million out of the $4 billion that it takes to run Congress. And when we talk about uh, $4 billion, again, that's a lot of money, but it takes uh, uh, that amount to run one branch of government. We like to think we're the most efi cost-efficient branch of government. Yes. Well, for every dollar Congress invests in GAO, last year we returned $124. Well, I wanted to ask you yeah. about that because uh, my question was, how do, you, how do you actually measure? I mean, you're an auditor, so you're right. into measuring results and, and uh, you know, can, you know uh, taking a look at, you know, waste uh, and all that other kind of stuff. So right. how do you actually tell whether you are $650 million roughly, and I think that's your budget request for the next fiscal right. year, right. roughly. Um, how do you tell the American people that this is worth the expenditure of that money? I mean, how do you measure that yeah. and how do you right. communicate it? Yeah, we measure uh, our financial benefits uh, to the country based upon independent third party estimates. So most of the estimates don't come from us. They'll either come from the You got other people studying you to see whether you're efficient or not. Or well, no, 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 no. We, or not we do cost like, benefit. Yeah, work. for example, uh, you know, uh, the uh, Medicaid uh, program, we convinced the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Studies that many of the projects they were approving for demonstrations uh, weren't budget neutral according to their policies. And so that they adopted our recommendation. They uh, have implemented it uh, for demonstrations going forward when they renewed the demonstrations. They weren't evaluating the results of the demonstrations. So uh, they took this action. And so as a result of that, from 2016 to 2018, they estimated that would save $100 billion. And about 60% of that was federal money. The rest was state money. And so this had that financial benefit. So the estimates come from the, either the agencies who implement our recommendations or they'll come from the Congress. If Congress decides, for example, to take action based on our recommendation about a weapon system or it's, it's not prudent to invest yet and to go into production, then the Congress will estimate how much money that's saved based mm -hmm. on the agency's submission. Or some of them come from CBO or the Joint Committee on Taxation if we take a, a, an action that's based on our recommendation that will generate more revenue to the government. So some of this is more revenue as well as uh, savings or it could be better use of the money mm -hmm. for, for a different purpose. And so most of them come from other independent parties. And then we have a process of fact checking within GAO by uh, people who or outside GAO that come back and check the facts and mm -hmm. make sure that our case is, mm -hmm. is there. So it's all well documented and very so good if you want to think about it in terms of, uh, of a traditional analysis of return on investment or cost-benefit yeah. analysis, I, what was the figure that you just gave me, 78? It was uh, $75 billion, and so it's, it was $124 for every dollar right. in, our, in our budget that so year. So in other words, uh, yeah. your recommendations, the, in, the enactment of your, your studies and recommendations saved $75 billion, and it cost $650 million to right. save that $75 billion. That's, that's, a, that's your math, right? Yes, that's exactly okay. right. Okay, correct. That's exactly right. And then we have over 1,200 other benefits that occur, improvements in public safety or helping, con for example, we did work looking at the frequency in which uh, schools were measuring lead in the drinking water in the schools and found that 40% of the schools hadn't done that in the last five years. And, you know, we, we found uh, problems with elder abuse in, in the United States. We found problems with drug shortages and make recommendations, particularly for cancer therapy drugs to require manufacturers to notify uh, FDA if they're going to have a shortage. And so FDA can take action to try to mitigate that shortage. And so there, uh, we've looked at uh, suicide lines for veterans to try to have prevent suicides. Mm -hmm. And that's mm -hmm. an unfortunate. So these are areas where perhaps there's not a direct monetary uh, benefit that, that at least that you can calculate, uh, but they nonetheless uh, have a tremendous impact on the American citizens and actually people beyond America. Yes. Okay. Yes. 
Let me, uh, I, I need to uh, uh, divert here for a second uh, and just uh, say that uh, the, the, of the uh, $4 billion that uh, Congress spends, $650 million we've heard uh, for the GAO, um, and you might ask what are some of the other areas that Congress uh, spends its $4 billion on. Well, obviously we have a, a full, a very full staff, uh, the members and their staffs, uh, um, their salaries and benefits uh, come, come out of that, uh, that amount. Uh, I've already mentioned uh, the Library of uh, Congress and the Congressional Research Service. I would be absolutely remiss not to now mention the Congressional Budget Office, which I neglected uh, earlier, which helps us uh, to analyze our budget on a, on a neutral basis, on a nonpartisan basis. Uh, they are the ones that basically, uh, sometimes you hear in the paper that the CBO scored a piece of legislation. That means they estimated the fiscal impact of that legislation. Um, also, uh, we obviously have a beautiful capital and many, many buildings that need to be constantly maintained. That comes out of our budget. Uh, and uh, we have incredible security needs uh, throughout the capital that are always getting much more complicated. And another area, and I'll, I want to get to this with you, sir, is uh, um, uh, protecting our um, information technology, which is a rapidly increasing need, and it's very expensive. Uh, we're subject to incredible cybersecurity attacks uh, uh, throughout every minute of every day nowadays, and so those protections uh, need to be uh, worked into, into our process. Um, uh, Mr. Dodaro, uh, you, you said earlier that one of your responsibilities uh, uh, was to assess the fiscal health of the country. How is the fiscal health of our country? Uh, we're on an unsustainable long-term fiscal path. Right now our cumulative debt is uh, $22 trillion. Uh, the uh, debt held by the public is about you know, 15, almost 16 trillion. Then there's money that we owe to trust funds, Social Security trust funds, Medicare trust funds that account for the difference between the debt held by the public and the total debt of the federal government. And let me stop you there because I think this is something that a lot of people are, are, are always alarmed to hear. I'm always alarmed to remember it in all honesty. Um, when I uh, pay my money into, the social, into Social Security, of course I'm expecting to get a benefit back uh, when, when I, when I comes my, my time to draw on my Social Security. And in the normal course you would think that that money was uh, put away somewhere uh, to, to, uh, to, to be saved and invested and, and uh, you know, um, allocated and, and uh, lockboxed, as some people say, mm -hmm. uh, so that it is, in fact, available uh, when the time comes for it to be uh, paid to me. But that's not the case, is it? We're well, actually uh, borrowing from the, from the Social Security. We situation. are, but, but as we borrow, the money, the excess over the amount paid in through payroll taxes compared to the benefits is... Uh, invested in Treasury securities. So the Correct. Treasury securities are earning uh, interest on, on the amount of money. And that was the case until um, about 2008, 2010 timeframe. Now the amount of benefits going out of the Social Security program exceed the amount of payroll taxes coming in. Right, so we're drawing so we're, on. So we're drawing off and redeeming these Treasury securities. Now the current estimate is by 2034 that will be exhausted and there will only be enough payroll taxes coming in to pay about 77 percent of the scheduled benefits that occur at that time. I've written special reports to the Congress about this. I testified just before the Senate and Aging Committee uh, last month about retirement security uh, issues that need attention by the Congress and so that very much needs attention. The Social Security program this year is estimated between the old age survivors portion and the disability portion to pay out almost a trillion dollars. Uh, so this is a uh, you know, large program mm -hmm. that benefits a lot of people in the mm -hmm. country. Uh, the, the other area is the Medicare Trust Fund. The Medicare Trust Fund also gets payroll taxes and is estimated by 2026 to only have enough money to pay about 91 cents on the dollar. So that needs attention by the Congress as well. The debt held by the public as a percent of our gross domestic product is 78 percent right now, which is a measure of the country's ability to repay the debt. It's only been higher during World War II, uh, where it was 106 percent of gross domestic product. 
or long range. When we were obviously borrowing a great deal of money to yes. finance uh, uh, the incredible contributions and sacrifices in World War II. Yes, yes. And I after mean, that, it, uh, it, our, uh, our, our expenditures are going to go up during wartime. Oh, yes, definitely. And so to have us sitting here in a, in a we, we are obviously at war, not to the same degree as World right. War II, but we are jacking up debt uh, at an alarming pace. And let me, let me give you a statistic that, that alarms me greatly. Um, I served in Congress 02 to 07. Um, early 07, so the beginning of that Congress. Uh, and when I left uh, Congress um, in January of 2007, our national debt, so the amount that was owed, uh, um, was $9 trillion. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, obviously it took us a long, long time in our country's history to get to right. $9 trillion. Right. Uh, today it's $22 trillion is what you just said. It right. just passed through $22 trillion. So when you right. think about uh, now, now sometimes those numbers just get lost in zeros. Uh, but think about it from a, from, from a, from, from a percentage uh, uh, perspective and, and calculate the percentage by which it has increased just since I last served in Congress. So we're talking only 12 years ago to go to from $9 trillion to $22 trillion. So something is obviously wrong. Now, anybody that's ever operated a home budget, um, you know, a piggy bank um, or a business knows the basic causes for increases in debt. But sometimes people forget. Uh, that those same rules apply to government, right. and let's just let's just let's just lay it out. I mean, how did we go from nine trillion to twenty-two trillion dollars yeah. in debt in twelve years? Yeah, what happened uh, largely in the two thousand nine time frame is when we had the Great Recession, and the country was at a point in time uh, where the credit markets were frozen. It's when the banks, a lot of banks, were failing during that period of time. The investment banks, the Bear Stearns, Lehman Brothers, etc. And so, uh, in order to pr uh, open up the credit markets again and allow for lending and, and normal efforts, and many assert that was to save from a depression during that period of time, uh, Congress created the Troubled Asset Relief Program the, and, and provided liquidity to the banks and auto uh, makers at that time. There were some concerns about GM uh, going bankrupt and so many Chrysler during that period of time. And then in order to stimulate the economy, since we were in a recession, uh, Congress also passed the American Recovery and Reinvestment Act, and that was over $800 billion as well. So between 2009 and 2012, we ran over a trillion dollar deficits during that period of time. Annual. The, so annual you're talking about annually. the difference every year between revenues and right. expenses. Right. That was one uh, 2009 was 1 1.4 trillion, and then it was over a trillion for another 3 years after that. The deficits start coming down. The Congress passed the Budget Control Act of 2011 that put caps on discretionary spending. Uh, and that, this is an attempt by Congress to actually control spending and to more closely link it to, to revenues coming in. That's, yes. So when we talk about budgetary caps, and we're going to see a lot in the news about this because it's very topical right, right. now as we go right. through this, uh, this fiscal budget and appropriations process. Caps means um, a, an attempt by Congress to put brakes on overall spending on the discretionary right. side. Right. And by the way, I think we should also talk a little bit here about the difference between yeah. discretionary and non-discretionary. Right. So correct me if I'm wrong, but discretionary, non-discretionary are mandatory uh, programs. Social Security and Medicare are clearly, those are uh, requirements in law. They're pretty much self-activating. Uh, they go on from year to year. Uh, they're obviously of concern if they're going up faster in expense than mm -hmm. the money that's coming in, as you've already pointed out, right. one of your and I agree, one of the real high-risk areas to our country right now, not to mention the people that defend, depend on those programs. Discretionary, though, is, is, is considered to be the money that Congress can actually allocate from year to year to specific uh, programs, uh, somewhere in the range of $1.4 trillion of discretionary right. spending um, every year, of which uh, somewhere in the range of 45, 50 percent, as I recall, is uh, defense-related. That's correct. And everything else is the rest. And so these spending caps, are an attempt, at least, uh, to, to control the spending side if the revenue is not there, correct? That's correct. That's correct. But the discretionary uh, portion of the budget, or the total budget, is only about a third of the total federal budget. Correct. So the the 1.4 right. trillion versus the 4.1 right. trillion that we talked about right. at the exactly. outset. Exactly. And the real drivers of the long-term uh, deficit and debt problems we have are really the mandatory programs. 
They're increasing as a, as a result of the aging of the population in the United States. More people are becoming eligible for Medicare and Social Security. You know, the number of people over 65, uh, on average between now and 2029, every day in the United States, 10,000 people turn 65. And so the percentage of people are going to double. And right now there's only 2.8 people working, paying into the Social Security system for every one retired person. And we're moving toward a, a ratio of only two people working for every one retired person in the coming decades. So we ne really need to grapple with the financial models that were set up to support these very important programs won't be sufficient. Now, Wait, the other, versus, yeah. versus um, take, take us back to uh, when Social Security and Medicare were started, one in the 30s, one in the 60s, where the there were many, many more people working yes. and contributing in than there were people actually retired and being paid. Uh, and I forget what my ratio is yeah. way back, but it was, what was 10 even, plus yeah. or something. Yeah. yeah, even in the in the in the 50s, and 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 it was about 8.7 people working. Even up into the 70s, it was about five people working uh, for every one retired person. So this this is the baby boom generation moving through the retirement system that we have in mm -hmm. our country. And, you know, it's a, it's a result of other, two other factors. One is increased longevity in lives, which is a great thing. People are living longer and more high-quality lives. Uh, and also the birth rate is we're not replacing, basically, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the, the number of people dying, and the birth rate is, is very low. So our labor force isn't growing very much in the projections. And is it's going to be less than one percent at, at a certain point. And we're not actually the only country in the world that is no. facing this challenge. We, no. Japan is probably the best example of a country that has, has a crashing birth rate and people living much longer and so incredible strains on their, on their social safety net, especially for retirees. Uh, Germany has this. Yes. Virtually all of Europe has it. Yes. Uh, and then isolated other countries in the world have, have all followed the basic model of pay in while you're working and be paid when you retire, but mm -hmm. the but the but the um, the assumptions under which uh, those those programs were put into place are now awry. Yes, which is one of the things maybe we can talk about at some point. Which is what do we what do we not know what's what's happening? But anyway, back to uh, um, I, I I would love to do an entire show with you or anybody else on Social Security and Medicare because. This is an area that you have uh, highlighted as one of the, your highest risk areas yes. for the country. And I, as I recall, uh, the GAO has, has kept this on its high risk list. Uh, this one was one of the very earliest. In 1990, I think, you said, hey, this is something we should be paying attention to. 1991, yeah. maybe. Yes. Some of that range. Yeah, no, we've raised that. The, the other factor, and I'd be happy to talk to you about retirement issues, because the other factor on the high risk list is the Pension Benefit Guarantee Corporation. The multi-employer portion is due to be insolvent by 2025. That means about 11 million Americans may only have $2,000 a year as a, as a total pension that, mm -hmm. that would be able to be provided. The other main driver of the deficit and debt problem is interest on the debt, however. And we've been lucky that we've been able to borrow large amounts of money because it, the debt has to be refinanced every year. We have to finance mm -hmm. new debt, but we have to refinance other debt because a lot of it's sold by short-term bills, treasury bills or whatever, and they're due and they have to be refinanced. So we've been able, lucky, to be borrowed very low historic interest rates, but those interest rates are rising. And as a result, in 2017, the interest on the debt was about $263 billion. This fiscal year will be about $380 billion. CBO estimates that by 2029 it will be $928 billion. So we'll be knocking on the door of a trillion dollars a year just to service our debt. Right, and I think that's that's an important point that sometimes, again, uh, sometimes the argument is made made to people, well, don't worry about the debt, don't worry about the deficit, and that causes people to somehow believe that, that running a country is somehow different physically and financially from running your piggy bank or your 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 personal budget or your, or your, or your business. Uh, uh, when we spend more than we take in, and we're doing that at the rate of one trillion dollars a year, uh, right now, have been doing it for a couple of years now. Um, uh, that money doesn't just get invented somewhere. That money is actually borrowed from somebody. It's borrowed from people that invest in government bonds. Uh, those folks are sometimes, uh, as you say, institutional investors, uh, sometimes just uh, people that want to buy a savings bond. 
sometimes they're foreign countries who can loan us right. their money. Uh, so then they become uh, um, creditors, and we right. become debtors to foreign countries. And some of some uh, some people, and I'm one of them, uh, um, are alarmed by that. Yeah, actually, about forty percent of the money comes from foreign sources. Right. Too. And so um, what you just said, and uh, I put this in a little bit of context, is that the um, the interest on our national debt is the fastest increasing portion of our federal budget, the fastest increasing. Yeah. And within a couple of years, we'll actually eclipse our projected defense spending. Because you talked about 900, yes. and yeah. right now we're at 700 right. uh, for 700 uh, billion yes. uh, for, for national And defense. actually, by the time that happens, not only will Social Security be well over a trillion dollars a year, by 2026, it's estimated that Medicare and Medicaid individually will go over a trillion dollars a year as well during that period of time. Right. Now, right. Portion, portion, portion of that for the Medicaid mm -hmm. is state money too, you know, some of it, so it's not all federal, but that's still the magnitude of those programs because those are the three fastest growing programs, the interest on the debt and health care. Right. So physical health is not good. Maybe we don't feel it day to day, but those are the facts. And uh, um, they're pretty un incontrovertible. I don't think anybody, regardless of what you want to do about the debt or what you want to think about it, can dis disagree that we have a trillion dollar deficit and a twenty-two trillion dollar debt, and that all of that is increasing. So, in your study of this situation for GAO, uh, on behalf of Congress, you've obviously identified solutions or options, I should say, mm -hmm. because as you as you say, you are not the policy decider. Congress is the policy decider. Uh, but you nonetheless are responsible and very well uh, present to Congress uh, not only the facts but uh, but the choices for what, mm -hmm. what you do about it. So what, what are the basic choices? Yeah, yeah what, what I've called for, and GAO's uh, call for, is that the Congress needs a long-term plan. Now Congress needs to decide year by year what are the national priorities. We have to take uh, pro-growth uh, approaches to have economic growth uh, for uh, health of our country, but we also need a long-term plan. So number one is you need a long-term When you say long-term, how long-term is long-term? I think it's got to cover at least the period to put Social Security and Medicare on a sustainable funding Right, path. so we're talking Right now, that's a 75-year period that Congress looks at. The, the trustees are required to provide 75-year projections. Mm -hmm. So you, you need to be long-term, and our government has difficulty coming up with long-term plans and then sticking with those plans, but we need to look out if we're going to be successful in this area. And, and all these numbers that I've given you don't account for a potential recession, uh, a war that would cause us to, to put more money in place. We don't budget for major natural disasters, which since 2005 has added about uh, half a trillion dollars almost to, to the deficit because we have to borrow the money. We don't budget for these things. And, uh, occurring with more frequency over a period of time. So we don't have a lot of room, flexibility in these numbers. Number two, the plan has to address all major aspects of the government. We need to look at revenues because the problem is structural between revenues and expenditures, as you pointed out. Revenues meaning taxes, Me tax loads, taxes. who's taxed, how much, uh, yes. fees, uh, other revenue generating yes. and, and, things and, that and nobody likes to talk about. Right, and tax expenditures. Right now, uh, the government foregoes almost as much in discretionary spending every year in foregone revenue through tax expenditures, allowing people to take credits uh, against the revenue that they owe the mm -hmm. federal government. So that. Mm -hmm. needs to be, and that's not regularly looked at. Mm -hmm. So you have about a trillion dollars of lost revenue every year that, you know, nobody says, is that really accomplishing the objectives of which it had? So we need to also look at all the mandatory programs because they're the main drivers of the debt and the discretionary programs. Mm -hmm. Also, we've pointed out there's a gap between taxes owed and taxes collected of approximately $400 uh, billion a year. There's also, uh, last estimate is about $150 billion in improper payments uh, every year. These are payments that shouldn't have been made or were made in the wrong amounts. The largest ones are in Medicare and Medicaid. 
last year Medicare. These are reimbursements that uh, should not have been made. Yes, these are payments that, you know, either it went to an, an eligible person, it was in the wrong amount. Now, are these of, fraudulent or mistakes or both? Well, it's it's both. Mm -hmm. It's both. And, and you know, there is a lot of fraud in the Medicare and, and Medicaid health care programs. Mm -hmm. We don't know how much exactly. Uh, we've made recommendations to address that, but there's a lot of administrative errors. And there's a lot of these, quite frankly, where there's not adequate documentation. Now, some would argue that they were paid in the right amount, but just the paperwork doesn't uh, match up. You know, my view is, is that if you're audited by the IRS and you can't provide documentation, you know, the government mm -hmm. takes your money. You know, why should we spend money without adequate documentation, spend mm -hmm. the taxpayers' money, even the, the revenues they've sent in or the money we're borrowing on their behalf? So these are all recommendations that we've made. Now, I've also, Congressman Case, made recommendations that the Congress needs to have a different approach in dealing with the debt ceiling. The debt ceiling right now does nothing to control the debt. It's only an after-fact matter that authorizes Treasury to borrow monies Congress has already appropriated. The debt the ceiling, uh, just for, 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 for my listeners, is uh, a, a limit placed uh, on the amount of total debt that can be um, um, incurred by the federal government. And um, when the debt ceiling is is exceeded, well, first of all, you're not supposed to exceed the debt ceiling. Right, right. Uh, then fundamentally the government starts to run out of money. Yeah, and actually it. we just exceeded the debt ceiling. Right, correct? right. So and now the government yeah. is kind of living on uh, kind of its stores of, short-term stores of money. So this is a, a critical issue for us right now. Yeah, yeah. Right now we're, we're using the uh, pension funds of the federal government. Uh, we're not investing those funds. Now it's all kept track of. These are called extraordinary measures that the Treasury Department can take mm -hmm. to stay within the debt limit while still paying the federal government's bills. But eventually those are exhausted and uh, th then the Congress has to act. Now, the Congress put a debt ceiling in place in the early part of our uh, nation's history, and actually Congress had to approve every debt issuance, but it got to be too large as government grew over time. So this limit's put in place. But the limit isn't considered when Congress appropriates the money at the beginning of the year, the, so the processes are divorced. Mm -hmm. And actually, if there's a concern that the debt may not be paid on time, investors ask for additional premium and interest costs, so interest costs go up, we have to pay more to service the debt, mm -hmm. and actually people are avoiding purchasing securities that might mature during a potential impasse period, mm -hmm. so it's distorting liquidity in the secondary markets. And so I've recommended that Congress change this whole approach mm -hmm. and, and look at it as part of the regular budgetary mm -hmm. and appropriation process, uh, and have more flexibility in place. We never want to do anything that would affect the full faith and credit of the federal government. That That's means the ability of the United States to honor its debts. When we talk about full right. faith and credit, that means that the United States will honor its debts, and that's what the rest of the world looks to for financial stability because many, many people in, invest in our debt and depend on us to to meet our obligations. No, that's exactly right. Okay, um, we're coming down a little bit short on time. I, I hate to leave this subject because I kind of left, we kind of left it dangling without a real solution, but I, I think I can fairly say um, there are solutions. There are policy decisions that can be made by Congress, by the President, uh, by all of us really uh, to solve these issues, uh, um, whether it be our national deficit and debt, whether it be to uh, rein, rein, uh, you know, reinstate uh, fiscal stability to Medicare and Social Security over the long run. There are choices to be made that can be made, should be made, uh, and the real problem, and I, this is me talking, not asking you a question, the real problem is that we're, we're, we're reluctant to face up to those choices because they're very, very hard and you anger somebody when you face those choices. Let me go to your um, uh, one interesting uh, uh, thing that um, um, you maintain and, and by the way, um, which is called GAO's uh, high risk list. So these are things that kind of keep you up at night. These are things that you've said uh, to to uh, Congress need to be attended to. And you've been doing this for a long, long time, not you personally, but right. GAO. Um, Actually, I've been involved. You've been involved in every single one because right. I'm looking down at the <laughs> list and I'm, I'm looking yeah. at your list here. And uh, here's, here's a picture of the GAO um, two, two, 2018 high risk list. Uh, so you can see that there's several on there in various categories. By the way, you can, you can, you can check out GAO right online at www.gao.gov. All of what we're talking about will be there in yeah. one way, sh fully transparent, uh, um, um, uh, 
agency of Congress, um, a lot of stuff on there. But, um, you know, I'm looking down your high risk list and you, again, listed Medicare and Medicaid. Medicare was listed on 1990, Medicaid in 2003. But there's a, there's a lot of other stuff on here and, and the areas um, that you are really listing uh, risks are um, strengthening, strengthening the foundation for efficiency and effectiveness, so running uh, uh, a little bit better, uh, transforming DOD, that's half of our discretionary uh, uh, spending, ensuring public safety and security, managing federal contracting more efficiently, assessing the effect efficiency and effectiveness of tax law administration, which you spoke to, and modernizing and safeguarding insurance and benefit programs. Uh, one thing that worries you greatly, you've already mentioned three out of the six on that list, besides Medicare and Medicaid, Pension Benefit Guarantee mm -hmm. Corporation, which is our, gov our government's way of ensuring uh, that when a private company uh, uh, does a, you know, gives you a pension obligation, that that pension obligation will be honored. The government stands behind that obligation. And as we know, many companies have gone bankrupt mm -hmm. and their pension plans have gone bankrupt, and so this is an effort by the government to say, no, we're going to cover you in, in that situation. Are there areas on your high-risk list that kind of rise to the top? And I'll, I'll just give you one that we talked about mm -hmm. during your, your, your testimony, that cybersecurity, which yeah. is just coming at us so fast. Can you speak a little bit to uh, what you see as kind of the frontiers of cy the cybersecurity issues and, and, and what we need to pay attention to? Sure. Uh, this area, actually, I placed it on the high-risk list initially across the entire federal government. So it's one th thing we always, first time we ever said anything across the whole federal government's high risk. In 1997. I should have pointed that out because that shocks yeah. me. When you, you pointed yeah. that out 22 years ago, and now we're kind of starting to think, wow, that's kind of a problem. Yeah. Yeah, when we've made thousands of recommendations. In 2003, we added the critical infrastructure protection. Uh, that's the electricity grid, our telecommunications systems, our financial markets, our nuclear enterprises, you know, across the, all the sectors of the economy. I was very, I'm very concerned about that as well. And then we added in 2015, uh, uh, protecting personally identifiable information. And we've actually recommended that the Congress update the privacy laws, which were originally passed in 1974, and, and put a new consumer uh, privacy fr framework in place for the private sector, particularly for information that's collected from people and then resold over a period of time. There needs to be some standards. Now, we've made many recommendations in this area. The critical ones, in my view, we need a comprehensive strategy and effective implementation oversight of that strategy. That strategy has to include uh, the supply chain, because right now there's a global supply chain and you don't know what risk are being introduced in different aspects of the supply chain. We do not have an adequate cyber workforce in the government, both in the public and private sectors. Meaning, meaning what? We meaning don't have enough people with the capabilities and expertise in cybersecurity I see. To, to manage the risk appropriately. Uh, that, that uh, we don't, we need to identify emerging issues. This issue because of artificial intelligence, quantum computing, uh, and the fact that our uh, adversaries are becoming more sophisticated is growing faster than our ability to deal with the threat. And I'm very concerned that the government's not moving with enough urgency commensurate with the threat and how it's evolving itself in the future. Is this a matter of policy or resources or both, or are, it, are we just um, inadequately resourced to, to combat? I mean, do we, know, do we know enough to know how to combat cybersecurity? I'm thinking about it more yeah. from a government perspective, right, right. Uh, given the, the cybersecurity cyber of the Congress and the executive branch. Uh, we, right. we just saw the, the, the Parliament of Australia, for example, was uh, subject to a massive cybersecurity mm -hmm. attack just about uh, a couple of weeks ago. Yeah. Um, apparently, quite well coordinated by some right. of our some of our potential uh, um, adversaries. Um, but do we do we do we know what we need to do to increase cybersecurity? In many respects, yes. Most of the vulnerabilities that have been exploited are known vulnerabilities, and we're not instituting uh, best practices in managing. We're not patching software as often as, and as fast as it needs to patch, for example. Uh, I mean, that seems have, to be so uh, basic. Well, a lot of these things are basic, what they call cyber hygiene mm -hmm. issues that, mm -hmm. that should be taken into account. Many issues on the high-risk list are basically management 101 issues. 
You know, 16 of them are on there in part because we don't have the skills necessary to carry out and the capacity to carry out the programs. So you're saying if about. you're looking for a career, cybersecurity is a pretty good career to go into? There'd I be a lot of demand in cybersecurity? Yes, we just hired uh, 30 cy people with cybersecurity backgrounds to increase our capacity in information technology and cybersecurity. We'll have about 170 people on board at the end of the year because cyber issues, along with technology and science issues, are becoming ubiquitous. Every federal program mm -hmm. here ha operates through computer technology sure. and is therefore vulnerable. And so there, there's new things we need to learn and we need to get better at it. We need to respond better when there are incidences to eliminate the damage and that's part of our recommendations in that area. But in the last several years, we've made 3,000 recommendations, seven of them, 100 of them haven't been implemented mm -hmm. yet. And, and so to me, there's not enough sense of urgency, as right. I said. Right. But there, there's a lot we know and we're just not executing on. And, and that's the sad part. Yeah. So I don't, we're, we're again uh, coming down to the end of a very fast paced hour and, and it's, it's been, uh, uh, I hope for, for folks that are listening in, a little bit of an eye opener on some of the challenges that we face. So I, I don't want to like go off this program without talking about some of the good stuff that's resulted because you have taken yeah. things off the high risk list. You yes. put them on the high risk and we did do something about yes. it. So can you give a couple of examples yes. of that? Well, a very good example that impacts people and I know this is a very important issue in, in uh, Hawaii is weather forecasting. A few years ago we were concerned that the satellite systems that we have that produce long-term and short-term weather forecasting, uh, were, there was going to be gaps between the new satellites that need to be put up and, and when the useful life would be of the existing satellites. And there are two types of satellites. Uh, one are polar orbiting satellites that uh, go over the globe in the early morning and then another one in the afternoon. Those feed long-term forecasts. Uh, and then there are geostationary uh, satellites that feed information that results in short-term weather forecasting information. There were problems in both. And as a result of being put on the high list, Congress focused on this as well as the Commerce Department who and NOAA has uh, some of, one of the polar orbiting satellites. The other is in DOD. The Air Force operates mm -hmm, the mm -hmm. satellite. Yeah. And so uh, NOAA has now launched a new satellite a couple years ago. It's operational, and so we're actually getting better weather forecasting information. I just, uh, I just, uh, NOAA is the National Oceanat Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, yes. which is responsible for our federal government efforts in the oceans and the atmosphere. Right. Uh, and I just actually met with the head of the satellite uh, um, uh, part of NOAA. It's, it's incredible. I wish I maybe I should ask him to come on yeah. here and describe the people, but that was a real success. I mean, and, and you know, a lot of the credit for that goes to uh, some of our congressional delegation, including yeah. Senator Inouye, who was a real champion of yes. NOAA and really championed the funding of those, uh, those satellites, but the world-class satellites, yeah. uh, not just only doing weather, as, as you know, but also assisting many, many other federal agencies yeah. and countries with their satellite uh, uh, needs. Uh, so. And um, another area we took off the list was uh, sharing of terrorism-related information to better protect the public. Right. This was a big issue after 9-11, 2001, mm -hmm. and we worked in the Congress passed legislation requiring a, an infrastructure put in place, mm -hmm. and so there's better assurance now that that information is right. being shared. Okay. Well, Mr. Comptroller General, it's been a fast-paced hour. I really appreciate your taking the time. Uh, um, awesome responsibilities and, and from my perspective an awesome job I'm really looking forward to working with you and everybody uh, at GAO and you know uh, really just thank you for your service and of course in our tradition in Hawaii we cannot uh, uh, let you off the hook without uh, giving you some uh, macadamia no. nuts to go <laughs> home with. So. Thank you very much I appreciate it. Thank Carson. you so much. I've enjoyed uh, it greatly. All right thank you so much. Uh, Thank you so much for uh, joining me uh, here for this uh, conversation with our uh, Comptroller General, incredible responsibilities within our United States government uh, and with the Congress. I hope you get some sense of the issues that we have to face every day and the things we're doing to try to fix them uh, for all of us. Uh, please sign up for my newsletter and I will see you again soon. Aloha. <laughs>